Thank you, Mark Murray-Thurton, for bringing peace to this room. Good evening and a warm welcome to everyone who came tonight. Thank you for joining us for this interfaith conversation, equality, freedom, justice, and peace for all in Israel, Palestine. Thank you to Reverend Megan Castellon, the rector here at St. John's Episcopal Church, and to the church community for their hospitality. Thank you to both Mother Megan and Rabbi Brian Walt of Community to Kumba Or for the time and the care they have put into their preparation for this event. My name is Linda Gaither and I welcome you in the name of the sponsors of this evening's program. Ithaca Chapter of Episcopal Peace Fellowship, and Ithaca Jewish Voice for Peace Committee for Justice in Palestine. I have the privilege to be a member of both sponsoring groups, so you get a double welcome from me. <laughs> you are invited to visit the cable set up by both sponsoring groups to my right in the hall before you leave tonight. At the JVP table, you can sign up to be on a listserv, and at the EPF table, you can sign up if you're interested in continuing interfaith conversations in our community. The idea for this interfaith conversation grew out of a more intimate interfaith meeting right here at St. John's last fall. Members of the Episcopal Peace Fellowship and Jewish Voice for Peace sat around the table at the church library right down the stairs to share our hopes and concerns for a just peace in Palestine, Israel. We savored the opportunity for honest, respectful discussion on a topic that frequently causes us to choose silence over the risk of speech. At the end of that very moving encounter, the idea for tonight's conversation was born. It is in the spirit of mutual trust and respect that we gather this evening in this safe place. Thanks are due to all those who have worked on the details for the event. Our musician, our sound system gurus, the refreshments, publicity, everything. And special thanks to our many co-sponsors who help spread the word about this event. Please note the refreshment tables are open for you all evening. Don't hesitate. And please don't leave without a piece of Mary Ann Brady's famous rum cake. <laughs> <laughs> Restrooms are located through the doors at the far corner of the hall. There are two out in, in the hallway for you. Our moderator tonight is Laura Bronca sitting to my left. She is a senior fellow at the Dorothy Cotton Institute, or DCI as it's called in Ithaca, a co-sponsor of this event. Laura has designed and led many circles and dialogues on racism and other forms of oppression and has been a community mediator for 35 years. In 2012, she traveled with the DCI Palestinian Israeli Nonviolence Project on their delegation to the West Bank to meet with leaders of the Palestinian nonviolent resistance movement and their Israeli allies. Laura, the mic is yours. begin by acknowledging that we are actually sitting and standing on the stolen land of the Cayuga Nation. And let's appreciate that we can be in this beautiful space with the awareness of the suffering and trauma done to the indigenous people who've been displaced at the hands of our government. Just take a minute to let that settle in. So, uh, Rabbi Brian and Mother Megan are not speaking tonight on behalf of their congregations. This is very live. Sorry. 
They're expressing their own thoughts, their own feelings, and their opinions. They wanted me to say that so that you understand that they're really speaking their own truth. So in that spirit, I'd like to suggest that you and anyone else who speaks tonight, that we speak our own truth and that we try to listen generously to the whole message of other people. And knowing that this issue evokes passionate responses, we might hear something said that we don't agree with. So let's be willing to notice our feelings and to experience any discomfort that may come up so that we can become braver at talking about things that we care deeply about. Um, please help me keep the pace of things going tonight. We have a lot of questions, and uh, even though two hours seems like a lot of time, when we get into it, it may not feel like we can really finish. And uh, as Linda said, feel free to get refreshments whenever you need to, or use the restroom, so just take care of yourselves. Here's the, here's the program that we have planned. We plan for Mother Megan and Rabbi Brian to have a few minutes, 10 to 15 minutes each, to give initial statements about how they come to this work and to care about these issues. And then I have several questions to ask them that will shape their conversation with each other. And around 8.45, 8.50, you'll have a chance to have a little break, stretch, and maybe talk to someone you don't know about what's coming up for you as you're hearing their conversation. And then there'll be 25 or 30 minutes for question and answers to Mother Megan and Rabbi Brian. Um, and we'll wrap up at 9.25 and say goodnight at 9.30. So that's what we have planned. Help me get there, help us all get there. This is an incredible, incredible turnout. Very, very wonderful to see so many people who care deeply about this situation and have hope for peace. So thank you. So the, we're going to begin with an opening statement from Mother Megan. And um, if you can't hear or it's really piercingly loud, please let us know because we can adjust the volume a little bit. Turn down the echo. Turn down the echo. That's the room. Yeah, we're getting a sort of God mic effect. <laughs> okay, now we're getting a no mic effect. <laughs> Is that better? A little bit? Okay. I'm the Reverend Megan Castellan. I'm the priest of this church. The church you were for that is the rector of this church. Um, I'm, incredible, I'm incredibly grateful to be here tonight with Rabbi Brian. Um, Can I have it a little louder, please? I think maybe you don't know who turned on. It's definitely turned on. I appreciate all the feedback. <laughs> if I take all the feedback, there will be feedback. <laughs> Is that better? I'm incredibly grateful to be here tonight with all of you. I'm awed by this turnout um, and by Lois's organizing savvy. Um, and I'm humbled and grateful to be here with Rabbi Brian. Um, and tonight I'm going to tell a story that I don't tell. And then I'm going to tell the story of why I don't tell that story. Um, I grew up in Newport News, Virginia, um, which is in Hampton Roads, which is Tidewater, which is where Pat Robertson lives. Um, and that gives you a picture of what it was like. My parents were devoutly Christian, especially my mother. She was an evangelical when I was a child, and so Bible stories were all we read. It was all we saw on the TV. It was all the songs we sang. It was all the movies we watched. And so I grew up with the names and places and images of the Holy Land going through my head. That was what I knew as paradise, literally. I attended public school, and public school taught me that Israel appeared out of the mist in 1948. It was a grand and glorious thing. And then some wars happened, as wars sort of like appear out of the mist as well. But it was just like the Bible, because the place names matched. And that was sort of all she wrote. But 
In my mind, Israel existed as this place that was a dream. It was the Bible come to life. It was a utopia. It matched all of those things I had read about in the Bible that was wonderful and real and there. So when I was in college, with all the white Christian girl privilege you can shake a stick at, as I was discerning for the priesthood initially, I got the bright idea that since I had already worked in Atlanta and worked in Los Angeles, well, I should really, like, go discern in Jerusalem. That was the obvious next step. Through a series of coincidences, I ended up in the summer of 2004, turning 21, and on a plane bound for Tel Aviv, where, for three months, I was going to work with Seville, a Palestinian center for nonviolent Christian liberation theology, um, and I would live at St. George's Anglican Cathedral in East Jerusalem. I had no idea what that meant. I knew nothing. Again, all I knew was that Israel had appeared out of the mist in 1948. I didn't know what East Jerusalem meant. I didn't know what the green line was. I knew nothing. But I learned really fast. On the Sharut ride from the Tel Aviv airport, I was kicked out by my driver because he told me in his very nice Russian accent with a big smile that he was a Jewish taxi driver and he didn't go to East Jerusalem so I could walk. I learned about occupation and papers when I was held at a mobile checkpoint for what seemed like an interminable 10 minutes by a really confused Israeli soldier who didn't speak English who tried really hard to decipher my driver's license from Pennsylvania <laughs> while he had his gun stuck in a taxi window. I learned about water restrictions and I learned about how to tell Israeli houses from Palestinian houses by looking at the tanks on top because Palestinians can't get water except for a couple of days a week, so they have to store it. So that's how you tell them apart. I learned about the roads you can't drive on, and I learned about the houses you can't live in, but your grandmother still has the keys, and if you ask, she will show them to you. I learned about the times you have to get on the bus really fast because the army has come and they've started shooting, but I learned that really, all things considered, that was a pretty normal day, and it wasn't as bad an incursion as all that because it didn't even make the news. My last week in country, two friends and I, went to Bethlehem, as you do, good Christians. We took several taxis, like you do. We changed at Betjala checkpoint, which is a calm checkpoint. It doesn't make the news much. As we passed in, the checkpoint was deserted. We were the only ones there with a couple of young soldiers, talking about 12. We crossed through, and three small boys on the other side cried out for our attention. They were selling gum. And we talked to them a little bit, we took their pictures, we learned their names, we bought chiclets in Arabic. They were seven years old, eight years old, and eleven years old. They lived in Aida refugee camp, which is one of two camps in Bethlehem. We walked on, we ignored it pretty fast, and we spent the day doing good touristy things. We saw the church, we did olive wood shopping, and in the afternoon we headed back through the same checkpoint because that's where we were going to meet our taxi. We called ahead and the taxi was meeting us on the other side of the checkpoint. But as we drew closer to pass through, the boys appeared again. They wanted us to buy gum again. There hadn't been a lot of customers that day. So we bought more gum, but we were in a hurry. We had to get up to our taxi because it was the only one. And so we kept moving and we got to the checkpoint. As I entered the cattle run, to the side of the checkpoint, where if you're a pedestrian, you have to walk through. The young soldier told us suddenly to stand still, don't move. And he ran out into the middle of the street, and he dropped down to the center of the dirt road behind a pile of sandbags, and he aimed his machine gun back at the boys. Inhabitants of the camps don't have papers. They can't cross the checkpoints. They can't come within a certain distance of the checkpoints. And the kids had gotten too close. They'd gotten inside the zone. <coughs> the soldier kept yelling at them in Hebrew, and I don't know what he said, but he clicked his gun, and I threw it back. There was a long, long moment, and then it was over. Whatever had happened was now over, had ended, and the soldier got back up, 
hadn't fired his gun, came back over to us and with a big grin on his face said, it's safe now, I've protected you. And he let us go through. Here's why I don't tell that story. When we got back to St. George's that day, we told the other Americans who were staying there what had happened to us. They didn't believe us. It must have been a test. You must have wandered into a drill. <coughs> that sort of thing doesn't happen. Who aims a gun at children? No, that can't be right. Later that night, I told the Australian dean of the college and our Palestinian chef, Khalil, was standing there. And they looked at me and said, I know. And I'm so sorry. That happens all the time. But I'm telling the story now because that day changed who I am. On that road, I came to realize that if I was going to be a priest, if I was going to stand in a pulpit and preach the good news, then it wasn't good enough for me to talk about a Jesus who made white Christian girls with privilege happy and safe. If I was going to stand in a pulpit and talk about Jesus, then the Jesus I talked about had to be good news for everyone. The Jesus I talked about had to be good news for those little boys on the road, as well as for that young soldier who was making life and death decisions. And if I as a Christian believe that God chose to be human in Bethlehem, then I best reckon with the fact that God chose to become human in a place with refugee camps and barbed wires and horrible things happening to children. That that is where God is. And if that is where God is, then that is best where I be too. And I'm here tonight because I believe ultimately God wants something better for us. God wants something better for us, but mostly God wants something better for everyone on that road that day. God wants for those little boys a world where they can grow up in safety and have lives with dignity and peace, where they can have health and wholeness, but not only for them, God also wants something better for that soldier. Because it does something to you when you have to point a gun at a child that does something to your soul. And I cannot believe it is God's will to ask teenagers to make those decisions or to do those things. That does something to you. And it does something to the soul of a country when you have to make those decisions in order to tell yourself that you are safe. I know that is an American. I want the land that the world calls so holy to be the land that we all dreamed of, the land of promise for everyone who lives there. And I am humbled and honored to be here to talk about how we might make that happen. Thank you. I'm also deeply grateful to be here. I'm grateful to you, Mother Megan, and the members of your church for inviting us into your sacred space. I'm also deeply grateful to you, Laura, and to Lois, and to Linda, and to many people who've done all the work that they've invested in organizing this event. I was born in 1952 in apartheid South Africa in Cape Town, seven years after the end of World War II. I was born into a deeply Jewish, committed Jewish and Zionist family and community that saw the rebirth of Israel as nothing less than a miracle. For our community and for me as a child and a young person, Israel was a great source of pride and joy. Israel and Zionism were a central part of my education. I attended two schools, Erzliya and Weizmann, both named after prominent Zionist leaders. I learned Hebrew and I loved it, and love it still, Hebrew. From my Israeli teachers 
and I loved learning about the land of Israel. I was involved as a teenager in a socialist Zionist youth movement, and immediately after high school, I decided to make Aliyah and to live in Israel for my life. For me, the goal of, a, of the Zionist dream was to create a safe place for Jews and to build a socialist society that exemplified the highest values of my precious tradition, Judaism. A Jewish society that would not oppress others as Christians had oppressed us in Europe. This vision of an Israel as a country that would reflect the deep moral values of Judaism was shared by many, maybe even most, of the early Zionist leaders, like Chaim Weizmann, who said that the test for the success of the Jewish state would be not the way in which Jews were treated, but the way in which those who were non-Jews would be treated in that state. Would we treat non-Jews with justice and compassion? Or, to use the frame of our discussion tonight, would the new state of Israel ensure equality, freedom, justice, and peace for all? Over the years, I have sadly come to realize that the state of Israel, the country that I and so many, many Jews loved, and still love. The country that revived Hebrew culture, the country that provided safe haven and provides safe haven for Jews, was created at the expense of the Palestinian people, the majority of whom were expelled, the majority of whom, three quarters of whom, were expelled or fled their land in 1948-49 and were never allowed to return to the homes and land that they left behind which were demolished down to the last stone over the next decade. The myth of a land without a people for a people without a land was a cruel and dishonest myth. It's not only that the creation of the State of Israel involved the dispossession of the Palestinian people, it is also a country that has systematically oppressed Palestinians, denying them equality, freedom, justice, and peace for the past 70 years. Obviously, for me to say that is deeply painful. I say it more often than Megan tells her story because I feel impelled to say it. Unfortunately, many of the people that I say it to are determined to be shielded from this reality and simply choose not to see it. <coughs> However, these eyes have seen a lot. I've been in the house of a Palestinian family waiting for the bulldozers that were going to come the next morning to bulldoze their house because in Jerusalem it's next to impossible for a Palestinian family to get a zoning permit to expand their house as their family grows. For the simple reason that Israelis would love to have as few Palestinians stay in Jerusalem and in Israel at all. And in the morning, I watched the bulldozers and the family crying and the police and the stones that were thrown at the police and the responses of the police to those stones. I saw that with these eyes. I saw it not once, I saw it more than once. I saw it several times. I have visited Palestinian villages which 70 years after the creation of the State of Israel are still unrecognized Palestinian villages and I have visited big settlement towns, many of them built for Jews from all over the world. I've seen homes, I've been in the homes in Siwan, in Jerusalem, homes that belonged to Palestinians that were then taken over by settler Jews with guns, who evicted and replaced the Palestinian um, inhabitants. And today that area is of course made secure for you if you're a tourist to Israel by an Israeli security firm that will ensure you'll be safe as you go around that neighborhood. I've met a Palestinian who played the part of Martin Luther King in a play that Palestinian nonviolent resistors made that Laura and I met 
on the DCI trip to the West Bank, who had been in Spain studying acting, and because his program in Spain was going to take more than six months, although he had been born and lived in Jerusalem, he would no longer have a residency rights in Jerusalem because a Palestinian cannot leave Jerusalem for more than six months without losing the permit. And I knew that I and any other Jew in the world who wanted tomorrow to go to Israel would be given a residency permit on arrival in Israel tomorrow. And I've seen land that belonged to Palestinian farmers that has been stolen by Jewish settlers along with olive trees that they've uprooted or burned. And I've walked down Shuhada Street in Hebron, a street on which Palestinians live but which they cannot walk on. And I grew up in South Africa, and South Africa had many atrocious things that happened there, terrible things. We never had sterile streets. I had to come to Israel to be on the first sterile street, because that's a sterile street, Rakov Spiriti, Bivrit in Hebrew. It's sterile because it's free from Palestinians. That's only some of what I've seen with these two eyes, seen many other things. The Indian author, Aranthuti Roy, says, quote, the trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you've seen it, <coughs> keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as a political act as speaking out. I grew up in South Africa where there were laws for white people and laws for people of color. In the Israel, a country that I once loved dearly, I see something frighteningly similar. A country where there's one set of laws and privileges for one set of people and another for a people who are not Jewish a country that accords privileges to one group and denies it to others based on ethnicity. This shocking reality breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because I'm Jewish. It also breaks my heart because I'm a human being. And it also breaks my heart because there's so much about the state of Israel that I still love. It breaks my heart because I believe that Judaism is essentially about treating all people as the children of God. What else could it be about? What else could it be about? And it breaks my heart because it pains me to see my people inflicting pain on others as pain was inflicted on us in Christian Europe, in the country that was created to provide safe haven and renewal for my people. As a Jew, I must, if I want to follow the God that I believe in, support equality, freedom, justice, and peace for all. It is what Judaism demands of me, a spiritual commitment, a mitzvah. Moreover, it's my responsibility as the dispossession and the oppression of the Palestinian people is ongoing. Every day, Palestinians, today, if you wanted, there are many things, you, you won't read about it unless you look for it. There are many Palestinians who've suffered egregious human rights violations this day. And the American Jewish community, of which I'm part, plays a major role in perpetuating that oppression in so many ways by our unqualified support for the State of Israel and for the massive American military, diplomatic, and political cover that Israel, that America gives to Israel. By the attempts of my community to silence and to prevent gatherings like this from happening. By denying Jews, young Jews, that were written about in the New York Times yesterday in a story about birthright denies young Jews the opportunity to even see or hear about the reality of life for Palestinians. And I wonder if the owner of the Toronto Raptors, who today announced that if they win the NBA championship tonight, he will take the whole team to Israel. I'm wondering what he will show them 
when he does that if they win the tournament. But I suspect it's not an answer that would make me happy. I care deeply about many issues of justice in the world and people who don't like to hear this point of view often say, what about Sudan and China and Saudi Arabia and Yemen? As a Jew, I care about all those places, but as a Jew, this place has my name on it. I didn't get raised with stories about China and Saudi Arabia and Yemen. The stories I was raised with are about Israel. And that's the country that's acting in my name. And therefore I've chosen that it's the country that I will take action for and speak out for. For these reasons, I'm with you tonight. And it's my I'm deeply honored to be here with Mother Megan, who shares a spiritual commitment to a God of liberation, to a Jesus that cares about those children and about the soldier child. I too care. My God is her God. My God too cares about both sides. And I'm grateful to all of you who have come tonight to listen, to learn, and even to challenge us. May this event help us move to a world where all people, where all people are given justice, freedom, equality, peace. Thank you. And how do you each work on this issue in your own communities when there are passionate differences of opinion among your congregants. So let's start there. Do you want me to start? Sure. We feel bad. Mm -hmm. Christians feel incredibly bad. Um, Christians have 2,000 years of anti-Semitism baked into our theology that we have entirely failed to adequately deal with. And to avoid dealing with that 2,000 of anti-Semitism that flared up into full view in the Holocaust, and that was, and the Holocaust was aided and abetted by Christian theology in Germany and elsewhere throughout Europe. But the Holocaust was just one huge example of something that had been going on and on and on for centuries. Because we have failed to deal with that, Christians are hypersensitive about causing any distress to our Jewish friends. And um, so we are very supportive of Israel because we know that if we are not, it becomes very emotionally disturbing to our Jewish dialogue partners. And because we don't want to look seriously and because it's hard for us to look seriously at the um, troubled legacy that is in our past, we sort of divert it to we're going to be super nice to this nation state um, and just never ever speak of it. Um, I've been told, I've told a group of um, my beloved colleagues that I was doing this and they said that's the worst idea you've ever had. <laughs> um, because um, it's, it's commonly known in ecumenical circles that discussing Israel in interfaith dialogues is the third rail. It's how everything falls apart. And this past week, I was at a retreat with diocesan clergy, one of whom told me very cheerfully that he really, he really kind of saw the point of that guy in the second century who thought we should just cut the Old Testament out of the Bible, because really, what was the point? That was this week. Like I said, we get around this huge problem that we really don't want to look at by focusing over here. I have a lot to say about anti-Semitism, but we'll get to that later. We care deeply about this nation state for the reasons I just shared, for what it meant in the light of modern Jewish history. And we know you feel guilty 
and we're quite happy to <laughs> insist that if you don't want us to call you on that legacy, you better do one thing, and that is not talk, say anything not nice about our dream. And that's the price you have for talking to us. I'm not talking to Megan as I'm talking rather as to what the arrangement is. Interfaith dialogue happens with that, what I just outlined and what Megan just outlined, as the implicit assumptions for that dialogue. You be quiet, right? We won't hold you. We're gonna we're gonna not going to cop to what, what has happened in Europe and as you pointed out to me Megan earlier this in the process, beautiful process that we've had preparing for today the irony is I'm not sure it's irony, the tragedy is that in fact it is the anti-Semitism that Jews experienced in Europe that was the propelling force that led to the power that created the desperate need that Jews felt for a state and having an army that would protect us. It wasn't to protect us against Palestinians who were living in Jerusalem at that time. It was to protect us, the, what we knew from our experience of trauma in Europe was what drove the Zionist, um, if that I understood you correctly. Yeah. Okay. And the, the tragedy of that, I mean, if that's not a tragedy enough, is that that problem has never gone away. I don't think you can look at the news today and say, hey, we've solved Western anti-Semitism. I think it's gotten worse. Um, that, that problem continues to spin because Western mainline Christianity has a hard time talking about it, dealing with it. Um, and there is a segment of far-right Christianity that is perfectly happy to run ads in the dead of night saying, well, you know what you need to do. Send all the Jewish people to Israel, and then Jesus will come back, and then the world will end, and it will pray. <coughs> That's not great either. <laughs> Everyone's going to die then. But that creates this weird odd bedfellow situation, um, which further complicates the thing. So I want to say something else about... No, I, should, I, should let you go. No, no. I think also, I've spent a... I'm invited about 10... For every 10 times I'm invited to speak, 9 times it's to a Christian or non-Jewish place to speak. So the one outlier is a Jewish congregation that wants to hear what I have to say. So I've spoken to a lot of churches. I've spoken to a lot of churches. One of the standard things that I speak in churches about is Christians want me to speak to them how do they deal with Jews they love and care and that are in their lives and then suddenly this question erupts and the whole relationship is up for grabs. And um, I encourage in that little sermon that I give there, that Christians should be very attentive to what's happening for Jews. What's happening for Jews has nothing to do with theology. Nothing. It has everything to do with existential terror. It has everything to do with fear for survival. And so when Jews hear a Christian say, you know, I just saw on the news those images of Israeli jets bombing people in Gaza who are locked in, they can't go anywhere, they have the most sophisticated military commitment, uh, um, equipment in the world, and they're dropping bombs on these people. And I just, I, I don't know what to say, but it's just really shocking. And Jews often feel defensive, wanting to defend it. Wanting to defend it. And I think that that's another part of this. That's not the institutional theology, Christian anti-Semitism, Europe. It's just got to do with the emotional I-thou encounter between 
that Jewish person and that Christian person. And my bottom line is to say to the Christians, you know what you've got to do. You're a follower of Rabbi Jesus. Follow Jesus. What would Jesus have done? Would Jesus have remained silent? Or would Jesus have come back and said, you know, I feel we need, I need to be able to say that it doesn't feel right for an army to be dropping bombs. And I don't mean in any way to be anti-Semitic, I just mean to be a good Christian. That bombs on the heads of an imprisoned people is something that contravenes my belief. And to share that and to stick with that, to stick with that. So here in Ithaca, one piece of my community, of our community, wants to shut off for its own fear, wants to shut off a particular part of our community. It wants to shut down any part of our community that questions whether, questions being Zionist, and which advocates taking any strong or even somewhat strong action to changing Israeli policy. And that translates into a massive uh, trying to shut down people who advocate for actions that may hurt, that may target Israel in any way, and also to shut out anyone who's not Zionist. So much so that, you know, even the liberal reconstructionist movement that I'm part of has several times tried to pass resolutions to cut out the rabbis in our rabbinic association who are declaring themselves to be anti-Zionist or not Zionist. God, they're still Jewish. We're still saying we believe in Judaism and we're willing to even do it most of our working hours, but it's not enough. We have to forswear Zionism. I want to say that at Tikkun Be'or, one of the things that has happened that is just, I so honor the congregation for, there are a wide range of views in that congregation. What I'm sharing with you is not the opinion of the congregation. There are some people in the congregation who share it, there are some people who share some of it, there are some people who share little of it. But what we do share together, after a long process, is that we won't go the route of shutting off a particular point of view. We won't shut that point off. And that's why the congregation supported this event tonight, because it doesn't regard supporting this event as supporting everything its rabbi is going to say there, but rather, God forbid. <laughs> but no, that's not. But, but it does support that there should be such a conversation. And I think that's where we need to go, both between Jews and Christians and within the Jewish community. And like you said, Laura, earlier, to sit with the discomfort that that's going to create, which is going to be <coughs> massive. <laughs> you said it. Yes, massive. Do you want to say a little bit more before I just take us? We're almost there. Yeah. So clearly, often critics of Israeli policy, like you are, uh, are charged with anti-Semitism, and. The question is, is criticizing Israel ever anti-Semitic? And how does one know when it is? I'm going to quote Rabbi Brian from the first time we met, uh, who said, the way you avoid being anti-Semitic when you criticize Israel is by not being anti-Semitic when you criticize Israel. <laughs> 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 That's very wise. <laughs> Um, don't don't be anti-Semitic. Just just don't do it. Um, some criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Um, not all criticism of the Israeli policy decisions are anti-Semitic. Um, I don't think it's proper or right to conflate the actions and decisions of Israel, the modern nation state, with. Um, Judaism as a whole, the Jewish people as a whole. Judaism is a worldwide, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-nationality religion of many generations and years and a breadth of opinions and life. 
to reduce that down to the security decisions of Benjamin Netanyahu seems really inappropriate um, and just uh, really sort of disrespectful, actually. Um, disrespectful of whom? Of the, the wide diversity of Judaism. Um, and I got, I got sidetracked by thinking how um, saying that it was inappropriate was like a vast understatement. <laughs> um, sorry. Speak your own truth. <laughs> so, for Christians particularly, I think we have a lot of work to do in this area. Um, when Ilhan Omar came under fire for what she said, she said APAC was um, controlling the government, but she said it in a tweet um, where she quoted a rap song. She said it was all about the Benjamins. She got in trouble because she's Ilhan Omar, that's number one. She got in trouble because she criticized APAC, that's number two. The other thing that happened was her quote was close enough to being about money, which was close enough to being about the anti-Semitic trope of bankers and the Illuminati and all of that, um, that most people didn't realize the reference and it didn't really matter at that point. Um, so that's that was what really kind of caught her up um, on a side, on top of the being female, being Somali, wearing, being hijabi, all of the normal stuff that catches you up in the year of our Lord 2019. <laughs> <laughs> but for Christians, part of the way we deal with this honestly is by not being anti-Semitic in other areas of our life. We have to do our work. Um, we have to, and I'm speaking to Christian clergy, um, we have to preach about why saying the Jews, the Jews, the Jews in John is not about all Jews everywhere. We have to stop and preach about why Palm Sunday is a dangerous, scary day for Jews around the world, and why passion plays have been used to stir up pogroms. We have to do our work. We have to, um, Amy Jill Levine is an incredible professor and author who, she's an Orthodox Jewish professor at Vanderbilt, but she teaches New Testament studies. And one of her avocations is to convince Christian clergy to stop being anti-Semitic in everything that they preach and say. Don't beat up on the Pharisees. Don't fall into anti-Semitic tropes. Don't um, assume things about the purity code that aren't actually in the text. Don't do this. And when you start looking at it, it's everywhere. Don't quote German theologians that were actually Nazis, they're still in print. Everywhere. We have to do all that work. All that work is ours to do before we get to, um, you know, fly the flag so high on this particular thing. But once we start doing that work, then it makes it easier to do the other work. But we have a lot of work to do. It's fun work, but it's a lot. Is criticizing Israel ever anti-Semitic? Yep. And how do you know when it is? Just when? When someone says something about Jew, what anti-Semitism is, is hatred for Jews just because they're Jews. Just like what it means to be racist is to have prejudice against people of color just because they're people of color and no other reason. And it's just simple human hatred. Hatred for either for Jews or for Judaism. I don't believe, I believe that most criticism of Israel has nothing to do with it. Semitism. That's my experience. I know it's not the experience of all Jews, but it is my experience. It's not that there isn't criticism of Israel that is anti-Semitic, but my experience is the overwhelming majority of, I mean, I work on this issue with Palestinian solidarity activists of all types, and I rarely encounter anti-Semitism. I encounter passionate opposition 
to the policies of the State of Israel that I share, but I don't encounter anti-Semitism often. It's not that it's not there, but I don't encounter it often. Um, and what I do encounter often is the attempt by mainstream Jews who are supporters of the State of Israel and want to squelch criticism of the State of Israel to portray and define, actually define, pro-Palestinian solidarity as anti-Semitic. So for instance, there's been enormous efforts by Jewish institutions to redefine the very word anti-Semitism and to have anti-Semitism mean primarily something like criticism of the State of Israel, which they may turn into demonization, delegitimization, and de something else. What was the third D? Delegitimation, demonizing, whatever, they're three Ds. They're not good Ds. They're not good Ds. But they're really big words that don't mean much. That don't mean much. Because what does it mean to delegitimize Israel? I think Israel's policies are illegitimate. They're illegitimate because they're immoral. Right? Does that mean that I'm in a delegitimizing camp? I'm not delegitimizing Israel. Israel exists as a nation state, just like America exists as a nation state. Israel does probably uh, a level below, much below the American state in terms of racism and violence. And just because we're such a big country, we've been doing it for a long time. So we've been as good as, as Israel's been. Right? So it's not. It's not a great contest to have, but... We're in the majors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you win, we'll take you to Israel. So, the, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, don't experience, I don't experience a whole lot of anti-Semitism there, but I do think Jews experience a whole lot of anti-Semitism there because I think Jews experience anti-Semitism. For instance, Jews talk about experiencing a lot of anti-Semitism on college campuses. I doubt there's a whole lot of anti-Semitism. I think there's a lot of anti, there's some and maybe a lot of anti-Israel activism. And I think it's profoundly uncomfortable for a young Jewish person to be in the presence of that criticism of Israel, it would for me, would be for me, must be profoundly difficult, uncomfortable, really, um, maybe even scary, maybe even scary. But it doesn't define that what we need to do as Jews is help those young Jews sit with the discomfort, to understand the discomfort, that those people are not attacking them, they're attacking the state that claims to name, be a Jewish state and act in the name of the Jewish people, it's not an attack on them. Okay, so, so okay. I'm gonna throw you a little curveball here Please. that we didn't talk about, but there is so much uh, violence, the, the bombings and the mass murders and anti-Semitic anti violence is very much alive and happening and so there is the <laughs> there is the the violent underpinnings of anti-semitism i can't imagine that those acts are not driven by some hatred and some devaluing and dehumanizing of jews and it's very it gets your attention when it happens and so how does that also influence the political and social climate or religious climate in which you can be critical of, of Israeli policy, which presents itself as um, all about keeping people safe, a, a safe place for Jews. And so how, how do we, how do we um, be critical of the, the policies that we don't like, knowing that a lot of the support of it comes from tremendous fear and tremendous trauma, and that it's not historical, it's actually happening now, here. So 
sorry for that. We didn't talk no, about talking no, about that. We talked, we talked about that we would be in the present moment. Okay. We have happened we are. Happens. Yeah. So you, you're we're more here. than more than welcome. I, can I, Megan, do you want to go first or can I just jump in? Go, yeah. I want to jump in to just say something to in response to Laura. The attacks, the physical violent attacks on Jews have left many Jews feeling terrified, mm -hmm. understandably, including me, right? It meant that for the first time in my rabbinic career, last Saturday, when I was about to lead bat mitzvah services in a little synagogue in Nancy, quiet little part of upstate New York, it crossed my mind what is my responsibility to the folk that will be there that morning in a world where two other sleepy synagogues somewhere, some crazy lunatic came in with a weapon and killed people? So yes, the fact is that that violence, both in California and in Pittsburgh, was the violence of white nationalism. It had nothing to do with Israel. And the other fact is that, in fact, most American Jews, or a significant number of American Jews, desperately didn't want Israeli politicians to show their faces in Pittsburgh, because they know that those politicians, like the one with an N that Megan mentioned earlier, in fact, hang out with a guy with the name T in Washington, right? It's and a new N word, folks. I'm sorry? It's a new N word. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that that person in Washington is a person who's given vent to that white nationalism that has a fierce anti-Semitism right at its core of its racism. So that's the first thing, to separate those out. There has been Palestinian or Israeli-related terrorism, uh, murder, I don't like the word terrorism, um, attacks on Jews in Europe, as being in Turkey. So I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, but it, the attacks in this country have been the attacks of white nationalists. I want to say something else even more provocative, if I can. I don't feel in any way protected by the State of Israel. In fact, I think the State of Israel does nothing, nothing, maybe less than nothing, to protect me and other American Jews. I think, in fact, the State of Israel is in some way probably neutral about whether there is anti-Semitism in America. Because the driving force for people to go and live in Israel is anti-Semitism. That's what led most Jews to go live in Israel in the first place. That's why Jews from the Soviet Union were courted to come to Israel, because Israel has what it defines as a demographic threat. And the only answer to that demographic threat is to get me and a lot of other people to go there. And one way to get me and a lot of other Jews to go there is to make us unsafe here. So I don't think that Israel wants to make us unsafe here, but I don't think Israel cares a whole lot about the lack of safety in, for Jews in North America. And if they did, they would talk to their buddy in the White House and tell him to go a little cooler on the questions of there are two kinds of people and they have different points of views, and there's some that think that, you know, it's um, the Jews should not replace us, and others think maybe the Jews should replace It's just too, it's a little spat between people with different opinions. <laughs> and they're good people on both sides. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how I want to order this. Um, so I think uh, I think you're right, Rabbi Brian. I can't I can't speak from the position of of, um, of personal.
personal experience. Um, but I at least see a very clear separation between um, the politics of the Israeli state and what's been happening in the US, um, particularly because of the actions of Israeli politicians and how cozy they are with Trump and um, Trump's coziness with, with really anti-Semitic um, Nazis. We have Nazis running around. Um, and I also want to lift something up um, for Christians. The shooter in San Diego was a Presbyterian. He wrote a manifesto um, that he published on Facebook in which he gave a lovely theology of why he was doing what he was doing, that he copied from his reformed Presbyterian minister that he heard in many sermons about how um, Jews were being replaced by Christians who were the inheritors of the true covenant, how when they refused to accept Jesus, uh, God took the covenant away from them and gave it to Christians. And so now Jews were pointless. He was a reformed Presbyterian. He wasn't a David Duke follower, whack job. He sat in church on Sunday, week after week after week. In the weeks after San Diego, there was a movement among evangelical pastors to sort of talk among themselves and figure out how they could sort of like back away swiftly from this guy. And one of them in the Washington Post article I was reading was quoted as saying, well, he did get a lot of the theology right, but the actions were definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> The, the dream of Zionism in the beginning was because Christians could not find it in our hearts to live in blissful diversity with our Jewish friends and neighbors. I refuse to believe that we can't do that. Um, I refuse to believe that the Jewish people I have known my entire life who have blessed me and taught me and laughed with me and taught me so much and given me their jokes and um, you know guided me along my way my entire life, I refuse to believe that what God intends for us is for them to go off and live in their own country, which is the only place they can be safe, because I as a Christian and as a white person am constitutionally incapable of keeping them safe here. I refuse to believe that that is the case. Um, and I think that we need to be careful against anyone, um, be they a prime minister trying really hard to put his government back together, or whether it's a guy in Charlottesville wearing, waving a tiki torch that tells us that the only way forward as a human race is to divide into little ghettos. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we're going here. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we don't have a lot of time. Okay, tell me. No, we're not, we're not at time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Palestinian civil society has initiated an international campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel as a nonviolent strategy for liberation. And several Christian denominations have considered resolutions in support of BDS. And these pro proposals have provoked fierce opposition from mainstream Jewish organizations, often resulting in tabling or rejection of pro-BDS proposals. <laughs> so, what is your experience with debates within Christian and Jewish communities on the issue of BDS? And what else could people do to prevent limitations on free speech, organize politically, and influence their representatives? You've got two minutes each. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I'm 95% in favor. And I'm going to tell you why there's that 5%. The Episcopal Church is one of the denominations that finally voted in favor of BDS, but we did it in a sneaky way. 
the resolution in favor of boycott, divestment, and sanctions has been sent to General Convention, which is our, our organizing um, polity arm, for 35 years. For 35 years, no one would let it on the floor. We were not allowed to discuss it. Finally, this time, um, it got to the floor, we had a debate, and we passed it, but the language we passed it in does not use boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Instead, we've agreed to sign on to whatever the Lutherans are doing. <laughs> and the Lutherans have a, a very nice human rights screen in place, so we're going to quietly jump on their bandwagon. Here's why. Um, the Presbyterians have already done it. Um, the Lutherans, as I said, have already done it. Mennonites way out ahead. Here's why this has been a problem for us. Um, first is the resistance of, of our major interfaith dialogue partners. Second is that we are part of the worldwide Anglican Communion. Our bishop in Jerusalem is not an Israeli citizen. His diocese includes Syria, Jordan, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem. Israel has taken away his travel permit several times. And every time that happens, he is unable to do his job or visit the places he needs to visit, like Ali Ala Hospital in Gaza, which we run, it's the only one left. Um, and he, at one point, they had him in jail, and the Archbishop of Canterbury had to intervene and get him out. He has told the bishops of the Episcopal Church privately that he supports the call of civil society for a boycott, but he cannot say so publicly because to say so publicly would lose him his travel permit and he can't do his job. Um, so it's, it's a rock and a hard place for us. That being said, um, when people are oppressed, you listen to the oppressed people. Which is another thing Rabbi Brian said. The topic for tonight, equality, freedom, justice, and peace for all in Israel-Palestine is the goal of BDS. In fact, when Palestinians were about to launch boycott, divestment, and sanctions, they originally thought of creating a movement for freedom, justice, and peace for the basically very similar to the topic to tonight. I think that's the guiding star for me in the whole conflict. Whether there's one state, three states, four states, or 25 states, the point is there needs to be equality, justice, peace, and freedom in whatever political configuration people figure out. And that's why I think, and I think that's what we should talk about, and I think that's what Palestinians are asking for when they say we want to use this strategy in order to get there. And I fully support their I don't have a choice much to support their right to choose that that's their way to get there. And it's a non-violent way. If it were violent, I maybe could say, you know, I wouldn't ever do violence, although that's not really true. But, but I could say, in my privileged life here, I would never use violence. I have no reason to use, to be that level of desperation I don't really experience in my life, not that I think violence is a good thing. But I appreciate people who act with nonviolence, and I, people have asked Palestinians why they've <coughs> used violence for their liberation. So this is a nonviolent strategy that they're committed to. I can only support it. I can only support it. Um, I don't, I, I guess I should say this too. It's a grassroots movement, so people do all kinds of things to promote it. Do I agree with every action that a local group decides to act on its BDS or to act on BDS? No. But I also don't, I also support their right to go at it as long as they don't spew hatred at Jews or Palestinians or anyone else. Um, does it make me feel uncomfortable sometimes? Yes. I mean, the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra is coming to Boston and it gets um, picketed. Um, it feels uncomfortable to me. 
but I totally understand why, and I personally would choose not to go to the concert, even though I feel, again, heartbroken that that's the situation. But I'm not going to turn to a Palestinian and say, you know, don't do that. Um, these, they are fighting for freedom, justice, equality. This is one nonviolent way to put pressure on Israel. I grew up in South Africa. BDS in South Africa definitely had some role in the liberation in South Africa, and I think it may have a role here too. Thank you. Okay, if you can find your seat again, we're going to have the rest of our time for Q and A. And here's the here's the deal with the with the questions. We're really asking you to ask questions of Mother Megan and Rabbi Brian and to not actually do your own sermon, which I know some of us could do. We could let ourselves go there. So please ask a concise, real question. And you might say it's for Rabbi Brian or it's for Mother Megan or it's for either or it's for both. But I'm going to ask... All for Laura. No, not for me. But uh, I'm going to ask our speakers to limit the answer to each question to five minutes. And Linda's going to give us that sign when our time is up. Okay? So, okay, so we're going to start with a question. Max, you want to go? Hi, so I just wanted to thank you both for coming out here and doing this event. I think uh, speak right in. Yeah, Can you so, hear him? Uh, it, I think it took a lot of uh, bravery to, to come out and do this event. So I'm really grateful uh, to both of you for doing this. And I'm just wondering. So we had. Can't hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if you could both touch a little bit on how both. Uh, Christian and religious Jewish communities should work to build up solidarity with uh, Muslim communities, both uh, on the topic of Palestine and just in general, especially as uh, both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are on the rise. Thank you, Max. Is that a question for either? For both of you. Oh, okay. um, I think solidarity is a big part of it. Um, you know, we, we've been sending cards, um, we sent cards uh, to the mosques um, after New Zealand, we sent cards to Temple Bethel and to Tacoma Baor um, after Pittsburgh um, and after San Diego. We've been, we've been sending cards asking, how can we help? Please remember we're here, we're glad that you're here too, um, and we're, we're created by the same God um, that we all follow together. Um, you know. Uh, Particularly, um, Christians are particularly called to solidarity because that's where Jesus is, and so we're supposed to follow Jesus. Um, but I think particularly in times when uh, marginalized communities are further under threat, that's where we're called to be too. So if we're supposed to be, um, you know, arms linked in front of a synagogue during a bar mitzvah, uh, then we'll be there. If we're supposed to be arms linked in front of a mosque, um, on, during Friday of the month, then we'll be there. Um, so. Amen. What a beautiful answer. What a beautiful answer. I don't have much to add. I, I agree that solidarity is really the key in this frightening world of hatred. The only thing we have to provide us with safety is solidarity across the lines of different communities. <laughs> Our community has reached out a lot to the Muslim community in um, Ithaca. We've invited them to come and actually pray and pray with us in our synagogue. We've gone to their mosque. Uh, we've raised money for their mosque. We've received um, messages from Mahmoud and others in the Muslim community when the, um, the Jewish synagogues were attacked and we received it from the church too. And we hope to be able to reciprocate too. And like Mother Megan said, I hope we also will have arms linked around a mosque or a church or any place because 
We live in such a frightening time, and the only thing that we have is one another. We have that solidarity. That's what will, what will really um, disempower those who are trying to make us to, to divide us in hate. So thank you so much for that question. And I just want to say something about this dialogue. This dialogue was set up as an initial event, and it came up as to why we could we include at a late time in this planning, could we include a, uh, a three-way conversation? And it's definitely in our minds that, that we should include that voice, the Muslim voice, in, if we, as we continue this, we will do that as the very next step, if possible. So thank you. Is it Kirby and Dad? Um, so one of the themes is peace. My experience of religion is that they have long histories of violence and war. And I'm wondering if you could speak to how you deal with that contradiction. I'll tell you how I deal with the contradiction. I talk about it a lot. My parishioners will tell you that they are probably tired of hearing me say that bad theology kills people. Um, but bad theology kills people. And the only thing that stops bad theology from killing people is better theology. I think for me as a Christian leader, the only thing that defangs our really bloody history is learning to talk about it learning to figure where we went wrong, and it was many places, and then doing better. But we can't get there by not talking about it, by covering it up, or by being triumphalistic about it. So I talk about it a lot. My parishioners are probably going to <laughs> appreciate the question a lot, the challenge. Um, I think I, um, I appreciate the fact that Jews, at least for 1900 years, didn't have political power. And I was taught the illusion that we, if we had political power, we wouldn't engage in military might. That unfortunately is not true, I found out. Um, and of course we have stories in our scripture about violent conflict, but I think about those stories mostly as mythic stories, although clearly the later stories have some historical truth to them. I mean, I don't think of the stories of the Torah as being history, but maybe later books in the Bible are. So. I treasure the 1900 years of victimhood and nonviolence that <laughs> Jews enjoyed, and it wasn't only victimhood. Jews had many periods of time when we weren't victims, but we also didn't have political power. And rabbinic Judaism, those 1900 <coughs> years, Jews deliberately gave up political power. Not so much, not only out of ideological, but also because it was a strategy to remain alive. So the strategy in dealing with the Roman Empire was to say, just give us a place to be and we'll pay the dues we need, the taxes, and just leave us alone. And that was sort of the way Jews subsisted for those 1900 years until this modern period. Um, I'm kind of happy with that model, um, with other people having political power and Jews being able to be a nonviolent community that exists on the margins. So that's the way, uh, but I also sometimes preach against, I definitely preach against Israeli literature very often, probably too often. Okay. going theory that no religion is good with political power. Lord knows Christianity hasn't done all that great. Um, and Islam also does not seem 
to be handling political power um, in several of its manifestations particularly well. I do not think any um, world religious tradition is designed to wield political power. I don't think that's what religious traditions are designed to do. Um, and I think to, to hold a religious tradition or the people who practice it responsible for the decisions made while someone is in the grip of political power is an error. Thank you, uh, both of you. Um, I, as a Jew, knew that expressing uh, opinions critical of Israel um, gets one persecuted by other Jews, but I was so surprised to learn from you, Mother Megan, that the same was true in your denomination. And I'm wondering from both of you what advice you have for those of us who hold these critical views for how to speak them to Jews who didn't come tonight, and I guess Christians who didn't come tonight. That better? Yes. Okay. I want to be very careful with language. Um, I have gotten pushback from talking publicly within the Christian community about um, my views on Israeli policy. I've not been persecuted. Um, nothing horrible has happened to me. I haven't lost my job. I haven't. Um, so I, I speak from a place of great privilege, um, and I want to be conscious of that. Um, I think the way that we talk about this is. Um, we tell what we've seen. Um, I think I took, so I've been back several times since I, since the story I told. I've been back um, with a class from George Mason. I've been back um, most recently with a pilgrimage of young adults that I took because I wanted them to have a similar experience that I did. I wanted them to see it and I wanted them to wrestle with what that meant for their faith. I'm going to lead another pilgrimage in January. Um, and the group I took were from um, South Central Missouri, um, all devout Christians, um, not politically liberal, not versed on these issues at all. Um, and every time Benjamin Netanyahu is in the news, they now text me with rants and various things. <laughs> um, and I didn't do that. Um, seeing it did. Looking at the, the wall did. Um, going into the refugee camp in Bethlehem did. Um, because it is hard to see those things in the place that you've read about as the place where God came and to, to not be changed um, and to not have to wrestle with your complicity in that. I also just want to um, say, Beth, that there are Jews here tonight who are here who don't agree with what's being said here. And I want to honor them for being here. I don't want to assume they know people here. I know they are, because I've spoken to them in the break. And um, so I just want us to understand that, that there are people who are brave enough to come here agree, and are listening and engaging and arguing and challenging. And we need to make space for that. You didn't do anything to not make that, but we need to honor that and make that space. Hi, my name is Pat Carmelli. I came down from Syracuse. I'm an activist there. I'm also an Israeli citizen. I lived there for 12 years. Um, this event was great. I did notice that there was a tremendous emphasis on the question of anti-Semitism. I have been personally attacked as an anti-Semite, although I had converted to Judaism. But as we're getting closer to 930, I would just like it if you two could end this with a call to action. And let the, I mean, I'm, I'm also jealous of the turnout that you got. We never get a turnout this big in Syracuse. I'm really jealous. Not a lot of you here. But well, if you we get the people from Syracuse to come here. They we, got about, <laughs> we got about four of us here. But anyway, if you could just say, 
Okay, folks in this room, if you care about Palestinian human rights, because as we're speaking about anti-Semitism, I don't mean to go as we're speaking about anti-Semitism, Israeli children are having their limbs shot at. Olive trees are being burned down. Houses are being demolished. So yes, I, I understand the question of anti-Semitism, but can we, can we please just talk about what those of us in the room need to start doing to bring an end to this horrendous injustice to Palestinians. Thank you. What? Right, so um, I know that there's a, um, there's an effort to get as many people to sign a bill that's being proposed by um, House, Re House Representative McCollum from, Minis from Minnesota. Uh, which is point, which is about the detention of Palestinian children and often torture and uh, abuse of Palestinian children who are detained. And it's coming before the House and there are 16, I think, 18, 18. 18 high representatives who have signed it so far. There should be many multiples of high, so we should, high is a Jewish number of 18. We should, and it also means life. And we will be giving life if there are many multiples of high representatives supporting this. So you can, I think you can get information about it up there, yes. and you can do that. Um, I also, there are organizations here that work, Jewish Voice for Peace, and the Ithaca Committee for Just Peace in, Justice in, in, Palestine. Justice in Palestine, and there are other groups around that you can join that I want to encourage you to join. Those are the things that I know about, but I'm sure they, I mean, I know a lot about, about a lot of other stuff, but that's a good start. You know some stuff. But. And when you sign up, the intention, we had the intention that when you came to this and you signed up with the intention to participate, we would keep the conversation going. So following this, um, JVP and um, Committee for Justice in Palestine and EPPN are going to get together and talk about what the next steps are going to look like. Um, so I really am grateful for your passion and um, your willingness to travel all the way from Syracuse. Um, but Not that far. <laughs> I did it twice yesterday. Not it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, call call your uh, your members of Congress. Get them to support Betty McCollum's bill. It's just a start, but it got all the way to the House, which is actually really good for something like this. Um, and sign up with your email. And you should know that, you know, when we were on the DCI trip, I mean, the stories that we heard specifically in Nabi Saleh from the family there about the way their children were treated were just horrendous, just horrendous. So children are arrested. I remember being at a home demolition in Jerusalem and the father coming the next day, we're standing by the rubble and the father says, you know, at two o'clock last night, I was woken up by the Israeli military. They'd taken photos the day before of one of their children throwing stones, 10 years old, throwing a stone at a bulldozer. What's a 10-year-old supposed to do? And who's he going to hurt with a stone at a bulldozer? But arresting the child at 10 years old in the middle of the night. So you know, that's a really important book. It's a really important book. We have time for one more question. This lady right here. Um, so I, I really appreciate um, some of the things that you guys were saying tonight about um, many things, um, but what I wasn't hearing and what I find really uh, important whenever we're talking about justice and equality and finding ways of creating peace is the importance of hearing and, res and honoring all the people involved and you kind of mention that, but I didn't hear kind of the whole picture. Very often when you were speaking, what I was hearing was, this is one little piece of it, and you mentioned bombs in Gaza, but you didn't mention the rockets going the other direction. And if, Lois, um, excuse me, can I just finish? I, I'm asking that question. You finish, but really wrap it up because we'd like to have I'm not stopping until finishing, but I think you've asked the question. 
I'm trying to ask the question. And I feel like this is really important because um, I believe so deeply in, in hope for both sides. And I'm just wondering why you chose in your presentations to kind of focus just on the one story when it's so important to find ways of understanding and caring for, as you said, all of the sides. So thank you. and I hear the feeling in your voice. The reason I focused on what I did um, is because those are the stories that I haven't heard. Before I came here tonight, um, I read through the newspaper, and before I came here tonight, I read through the newspaper online, and there are a couple of stories about a rocket that hit a house in the Negev. There were no stories about. There were no stories about the bombs that fell in Gaza um, a couple hours later. I found out about that through a Twitter friend. I wanted this conversation to talk about the stories that we don't hear. I wanted this conversation to be about the stories that we have trouble hearing because the people who inhabit those stories don't have access to the power that the people who inhabit the other stories have. When we talk about equality and justice and peace, part of that conversation has to be to examine the hard part, which is that there is inequality, and that is part of what we're trying to address. There is inequality in that one group of people have a military and that one group of people do not. There is inequality in that one group of people have access to water on a consistent basis and one group of people do not. This does not mean that one group of lives is more precious than another group of lives or that one group of lives have more um, entitlement to live than another group of people. The death of any child is horrible in the sight of God. But it does mean, when we work for equality, that we have to honestly consider the inequality that is present. And so the reason that I focused on the stories I did is because those are the ones, those are the ones that, in my experience, we have trouble hearing. So that's why. I appreciate it. I, 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 I agree with what Megan said. I mean, that's why I tell the stories I tell. The other stories are told over and over again in my context. And when these stories that I tell are told, they're usually silenced. It's very rare, as I said, for these stories to be shared in my context of my community. But it's true, I live in a very sheltered community. I mostly live in the Jewish community. So in the Jewish community, it's mostly other stories that are told. And my, the stories I tell are usually silenced, or try to be silenced. So I want to tell those stories so as to create balance. And I totally agree that all lives are you know, precious and sacred, the Israeli soldier and the child. But I actually think even tonight, I felt like it was a way in which I felt like we overemphasized the, um, the, the concern about anti-Semitism and about the role of Jews because I was here and because the people in the audience that are Jewish and because... But the fact is, there was very little tonight that really talked about, from the point of view of Palestinians, what it's like to live as a Palestinian and what it means. And I felt during tonight, I felt like, I just wish there was a way for us to be able to, for me, I felt like I was responsible in some way. Could I somehow, at the same time, while explaining the Jewish uh, inner 
position that I hold and what's going on for me as a Jew to really sit back and create some space for the Palestinian uh, experience to be shared. And I hope that if we continue, we will allow that to happen because there are very few places in America where Palestinians get to tell their stories. Palestinians don't need to rely on Rabbi Walt or Reverend uh, Megan to tell their stories. They're alive. They can tell their stories themselves if we would create the space for them to tell it and for us to hear it. So this summer I had the incredible fortune of being in an apartment in New York City with a group of Jews who invited the leader of the uh, March of Return in Gaza and another person from Gaza to speak to Jews in an apartment. It felt like a miracle, like there's just, no one ever talks to people from Gaza. We don't ask them what they think, we always talk about them because they're in a ghetto that's isolated and that's enclosed. And so it felt so liberating for me to actually hear a real live human being from Gaza just talk to me about what life's like for a Gazan. And I feel like we need to let, hear those stories as much as possible. So we are at that time and we need to be respectful. It's, it's late uh, for Thursday night. If you want to stay in touch, please feel free to sign up uh, for future conversations and for information. Uh, at this table back here, there are sign-up sheets. It's really important to keep it going. I know we're not finished with this. We're just getting started. Um, thank you, everybody. This is an amazing gathering, and I appreciate it. I feel so honored to have been a part of it. So, safe travels home. Let's, let's, thank, let's thank Laura and everyone. Yes.